Hi there, I'm Matthew Lister from the Rhodes Business School. And over the last 10 days, some very interesting statistics have come out about the state of higher education in South Africa. These have come mainly in two forms. Firstly, the Department of Statistics has issued a report. And secondly, we have had the medium term budget policy statement in Parliament by Provin Gordon. Those two documents have to be lo looked at together. And some interesting papers to throw into the argument come from Alvarado and Atkinson, and also the University Fee Story in South Africa by Clutti et al. Watch me now and see how we go. Now, Thomas Piketty has made a lot of noise about education. We looked at that in our previous video. And he's basically saying, if one looks at the inequality in education, it's obvious. The poorest deciles hardly have a chance of getting their children to university, whereas when one gets to the richest deciles, well, then nearly everybody goes to university. So the obvious solution is therefore to provide direct and immediate financial in interventions at the lower scales. In South Africa, we'd call that NISFAS. Then we've got the middle order, which we think, okay, maybe business can help that, and the wealthy can look after themselves they're actually very lucky to get a subsidy on their fees. Let's bear that in mind as we go along. Now, in amongst this, when one looks at the income deciles of South Africa, we see a major problem. We see that the poorest deciles in South Africa virtually have no chance of getting to university. The reason primarily is that their matrics and their other qualifications don't get them there in the first place. So, we are talking about an elite lot, and they are mainly from the richest deciles there. So what we are saying is, who is at university? Now look at this from the statistics. If you are in education and you are aged between 5 and 24, then only 5% are actually attending university. The rest are somewhere else. So one has to say, that the university students are actually in themselves an elite bunch. And we should be looking at this matter on a far broader context and asking some questions, how do we get more people educated further? Not only how do we deal with a million or so students. So, moving on from there, we say, what's happened? This graph clearly shows where the fees must fall crisis came from. If one looks at the fee increases that went through in the years leading up to the fees must fall crisis, they are way above the inflationary increases. That reached a breaking point in 2015, and from there on, in effect, we have had a zero increase in fee income. Now, this is very important in looking at the following statistics, because they are based on the university financial statements up to 2015 and consequently they do not have the full effect of the fees must fall crisis in these numbers. So let's take it from there and we roll it forward again and we say government's reaction is to say we are doing much for universities. Look at our increased funding and they draw pretty pictures about it which show that it's all going up actually faster than anybody else and that the post-school budget is going up virtually faster than everything else. And so government is giving itself a pat on the back saying, we are dealing with the crisis. It doesn't seem so if you are at university. We take that further and we say, what are the forms of university income? Well, we have the grants and the criticism of the grant system is that it is what the economists call regressive. In other words, everybody benefits from it rich and poor and maybe that's a problem. What we are seeking to do now is to take that further and say, right, the grant system must be extended to cover the tuition fees as well, which would be more than two thirds of the university's income. We also mustn't lose sight of the other receipts of universities, the so-called third stream income, which makes up about 30% of the total. So we take that and we say, right, there is the higher education enrollment of South Africa since 2006. And we see that university enrollment has grown from 746,000 in 2006 up to 985,000 in 2015. 
Keep that 985,000, put a peg in that, we're going to work with that number, it's very important. Now let's look at the demographics of the student enrollment. And first up we have to say that a third of South Africa's students are at UNISA. They are distance-based students. And they are thrown in with all other universities. And then we've got to say, hang on, there's an enormous difference in the size of universities. So as we're at the University of Northwest might have 64,000 students, when one comes down to Rhodes, we've just got 8,000. And that makes a massive difference in the economies of scale of a university. Immediately, we look at a problem and say, how can we create a one-size-fits-all solution when the universities are of such different sizes? That creates a challenge in itself. Let's illustrate it to you. So UNISA has the highest tuition fee income in South Africa, 3 billion rand a year. And you say, my God, that's a lot of money. But they've got a third of the students. When we compare that to Rhodes University, we've got tuition income of 431 million rand a year. It's a completely different scale and needs a completely different solution. Let's illustrate it. If one looks at tuition fees as a percentage of total income, we see that UNISA's right up the top there at 45% of the income comes from tuition fees. But Rhodes is also right up there. But they're two different animals. UNISA is receiving uh, income from distance-based students. Rhodes University is substantially a residence-based system. So again, how can you put these things in the same pot? It's almost impossible. So now take it further and we say, here's an idea coming from the statistics already. We must maybe say, hash fees must fall at UNISA. Why? Watch this. If we made UNISA free, that would cost an additional subsidy of 3 billion rand based on its current enrollment. And that's only 14% of the tuition fees. But it would cover 337,000 students of the 985,000 students. Or 33% of the problem by number of students is catered for for a mere 3 billion rand. There must be some potential in that. There must be something more that we can do with that. So we need to divide the problem initially from the basis of finding a solution for UNISA and then finding a solution for the other universities according to their size. And we have to concentrate and say, look, UNISA's there. Okay, distance-based education is not the universal panacea everybody made it out to be. But we could improve it and make it the best distance-based program in the world using modern technology and make it for free, and make it accessible to all. And that might take some stress off the whole problem. Then we can look at the other 648,000 students that are sitting at other universities paying 18 billion rand a year in fees and say, hey, what solution can we generate for them? So we continue with this and we say, right, if the total fee income for all universities in 2015 was 21.5 billion. I'm surprised at that number because a lot of people have been putting it a lot higher. So we're going to have to interrogate that number further in a subsequent video on this. Put a pen in it at the moment. But let's say that we have to find 30 billion in today's terms based on stats essay estimates to solve the problem. What would be the implications on the national budget if we put out 30 billion to 1 million students? Let's illustrate it like this. Let's look at the other grants, the other end of the scale, the poorest of the poor. And we'll say the child support grant has gone to 350 rand per month. So, if we were to give the children of South Africa some extra money, as the students are demanding, we would say 1 million rand buys 238 child grants per annum. A billion rand buys 238,000 child grants per annum. So 30 billion rand would get us about 7.1 million child grants. If we put that another way, we say, what are we spending on child grants today? 51 billion rand per annum. And we are giving 12 million children that grant of 350 rand per month. 
The grant of free fees for all is to say, using that formula there, that we would take the equivalent of increasing the child grant from 350 rand per month to 555 rand per month for 12 million children. It's a massive scale if one looks at it in those terms. So the answer is fees must fall for all is not sustainable. It actually would be an unfair distribution when measured against the, the expectations of the poorest of the poor. We have to find another solution and let me tell you there are lots of them available. Let's have a look at it further. So government is saying we are so stressed now in the current economic circumstances that our real capita spend is looking at being static. We're not growing it, we're not getting it any better, we're just holding our nose just above the water. That's where we are today. But they say in spite of all of that, the second biggest increase in expenditure is on post-school education and training. Now, we can't control our interest bill in South Africa. We never have been able to control that. So we'll leave that one out of it. In other terms of other votes of government, post-school education is getting the most. And they think that that's really wonderful. And they draw pretty graphs of how the university subsidies, including this FAS, are going up through the roof. So we take that and we say, read the numbers in the MTBPS last week, and they say 5.6 billion rand was added to university subsidies to fund the 0% increase of the 2016 financial year. Then they go further. NISFAS in 2016 will receive an extra 10.6 billion rand during the MTBF period. Don't read that, please, as 10.6 billion rand in one check. That's spread over the MTBF period. That's three years. Then, of this amount, 2.5 billion has been sent to inadequately funded students from 2013 to 2015. So we've spent 2.5 billion on playing catch up. And we then say the remaining 8 billion will be for going forward over the next three years. So that's three or four billion rand a year. And that's where this graph comes from, where they say, with all of that amount of money, we're spending more on post-school education than anywhere else. And if we take that graph and we compare it to what is in Clutie's papers, he says South Africa is basically spending 0,17% um, of its GDP on higher education. And government comes back and says, no, we're spending 1,5%. And then they produce that graph in the MTBBS. And we all go, wow, but look at the breakdown. The breakdown shows that the subsidies to universities are still at around 0,8%. The other half is what is spent outside of the university on post-school education on things like the CETA program. And this, again, is incredibly important in bringing pressure to bear in other parts of the post-education debate. If we are spending all of this money through the CETAs, what value are we getting from that spend, and should it not be better deployed? It's very important, that question, because the continuance of the CETA system is to be assessed in 2018. Are we doing it right there? I've got some major reservations. So now we go back and we say, looking at these stats again, we have the three components of university income. And we've got to say, that's very fine. But doesn't this in itself lead to a very distorted position? And this is where we start looking at third stream income of universities. And we see that the third that higher education institutions received 4 billion rand in the form of donations in 2015. Now look at this. A university like Stellenbosch, its donations were a quarter of the total pie. Down here at Rhodes University, we're looking at 79 million rand a year, and most of that is the council funding of bursaries. And then we go down to some of the tiny universities, and we see that they get virtually nothing. Now, this in turn tells a story. 
it says there are rich universities and there are poor universities. And again, that points to the issue of saying, how can we find a model, a one-size-fits-all model, that's going to suit all universities, some rich and some poor? That just can't be done. Take it further. See what we spend on bursaries. So, Cape Town and Stellenbosch, which are well endowed and have third stream income, can spend a lot more on bursaries than the likes of Rhodes University, where its donation income is very limited. Again, this stresses the importance of the difference between the universities based on their third stream income and endowments. And I think that that should be taken into account in this whole debate. And now we look at our operating surpluses, which vary dramatically. The net operating surpluses of universities in 2015 came to 2 billion rand. Well, I'm sure it's not going to look like that in 2016. Why? Because of the loss of fees relating to the fees must fall crisis. But look at how the difference goes between Pretoria up at the top with a surplus of 680 billion rand versus UNISA 474 the other way and Rhodes sitting in the middle. So we take that and we say, but that's an operating surplus. You can't run a university with an operating surplus. What about the cash position of universities? So look at the change. Pretoria had 316 million rand more this year than they had last year. Rhodes at a standstill position. But again, we look and say, there are some of the more well-endowed universities where they have still got an operating surplus. What's happening with that? Again, the difference between rich and poor universities. And then when it comes to CapEx, who's spending the money? Well, the richer universities. So if we take the model between rich and poor, it doesn't only apply to people, it applies to universities. The more well-endowed universities have got lots of money, they can build more buildings. Whereas we go down the bottom and they can do practically nothing. Now, let's finish off with some real shockers of what is to come. Firstly, we must have a look and say, what about the future? What does the first year intake look like? And I think that this gives some potential solutions. We see very surprisingly that only 17.5% of the university population is first years. So this comes back to my big argument, divide and conquer again. If we said, let's extend the definition of basic education to include first year university, then we can take that 17% population and say, hey, you can come and give university a try for free. And then if you pass your first year, we'll provide a guaranteed and subsidized loan system through the private sector to replace NISFAS so that we can get a different funding model going, completely different to what we've got at the moment. But actually this last slide is, I'm, I'm almost too frightened to show it to you, because it demonstrates a, a nub of a problem. And this shows the alarming evidence that's pointing to regressive proportions of bachelor's completion of degrees by black people. And it is a shame that after 22 years in the New South Africa, we have not yet been able to redress that. So what we are having, and I think that this is giving rise to a lot of the anger at universities today, is for those who get there through NOSFAS, etc. That's not the end of the debate. The throughput rates are just not good enough. And we are not doing enough at universities to analyse that question and say, why? How can we transform education to make fix that? They can't all be in the wrong. We can fix the university crisis with a spirit of cooperation, but it's going to take that because it's not only about the fees. No one-size-fits-all model is going to cater for all universities and for all, u all university students. In as much as we have rich students and poor students, we also have rich universities and poor universities. And that gap would seem to be getting wider. So that's only the start to the debate as to how we finance it. The challenge is to go far further and to find a solution in higher education that is more appropriate to South Africa. Thank you for your attention.